Hello, welcome to Encore. I'm Rochelle Harrison-Pless. Thanks for joining us. Coming up on the show. From Alaska to the Andes and Cuba to Curacao, award-winning American author Russell Banks takes readers to all four corners of the globe with his latest book, Voyager Travel Writings. But the work is also a memoir, reflecting on how his wanderlust has impacted the relationships in his life. Voyager Travel Writings has just hit bookshelves here in France, and Russell joins me in the studio today. Russell Banks, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Rochelle. It's nice to be here. Now, Voyager Travel Writings, uh, this was a, a very personal book, mm -hmm. memoir meets uh, travel writing. Tell us more mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a book I probably couldn't have written when I was younger because it's a, it's a book that looks back over a lifetime. A lifetime of travel, yes, uh, but also uh, it's the story of a man dealing with aging uh, in his middle, late 70s. Uh, a man dealing with, uh, with uh, what is in some ways a, a puzzle to him, which is how on earth did he come to be, have been married four times and divorced three times. Uh, so it's an attempt to unravel both those puzzles, the one, the puzzle of aging and the puzzle of his marriages through the genre, through the lens, if you will, of, of, uh, of travel. Now, the first line uh, of the book uh, reads, uh, a man who's been married four times has a lot of explaining to do. Mm -hmm. Indeed, there were some tough passages uh, mm -hmm. in the book uh, when you spoke about um, your crying, uh, distraught uh, first wife. You said, mm -hmm. I watched and waited in silence like a bodyguard instead of a husband. Uh, what was the reaction from your ex-wives uh, to your version of events after all these years? Well, I think they were very forgiving. Um, and they, two of them that I spoke with about it, uh, thought that I was a little hard on myself. Um, Interesting. And uh, they uh, did not feel I was particularly hard on them, and I'm glad of that. Uh, I tried to be as respectful and decent uh, as I could, and also to respect their privacy as much as I could. But uh, everyone has a different memory uh, of the same event, uh, right. and so that it's a different narrative altogether. And I'm sure that if any of them wrote their accounts, it would be uh, quite a bit different from mine. Mostly, I was concerned about the response of my four daughters. Uh, and they, too, said, Dad, you, you, you've been a little hard on yourself <laughs> in that way. But, uh, but I'm glad of that. It's better than using uh, uh, writing as revenge uh, or writing mm. as an expression of simply of anger. It's better to use it for forgiveness and culpability, I think. Okay, now you're well known uh, for your works of fiction, mm -hmm. uh, Continental Drift, Cloud Splitter, as well as The Sweet Hereafter and Affliction, uh, which were both made into films. Uh, let's take a, a quick look at a short clip uh, of 1997's Affliction, starring Nick Nolte and Sissy Spacek. You going somewhere, Margie? I'm just clearing out some of the stuff that's piled up for the rummage sale. And some of it's for the cleaners and the laundromat. Don't lie to me, Marge. You're leaving me. I can see that. Don't be silly. Hi, Jill. Marge. Now, Russell, if Voyager travel writings was made into a film, who would play you? Oh, that's a <laughs> tough question. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd love it if, say, Matthew McConaughey <laughs> or someone <laughs> like that could. But uh, I don't know who would play me. That's an interesting and difficult question. I would uh, Nick Nolte in his prime, I think, uh, he, uh, would be great. Uh, in that film, he was superb. And, and Fantastic performance. Nominated for an Academy Award and many other awards in that film. Uh, now, one of the first things that uh, stood out to me when uh, when reading Voyager was um, the difference that you uh, talk about between a traveller, what it means to be a traveller and, and a tourist. Mm. Uh, you said travellers don't take pictures and, and that you yourself haven't taken uh, travel photos for, for 30 years. What else sets you apart from, from tourists and even other travellers? Well, I think at a, at a kind of abstract level, uh, a, a traveller is going towards some place and, and, and is trying to enter into a place that is unknowable to him otherwise, except through 
entering into it, into being there, being on the ground. Whereas a tourist is more often than not trying to get away from something and trying to escape, get away from the routine of daily life, get away from the cold northern climate, whatever. Um, and so it's 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 really a different of intention and a different function then too. As uh, as I said, uh, uh, travelers rarely take pictures. Um, I, in fact, at the end of every day when I'm traveling, end up with uh, my notebook and and I try to spend an hour at the end of the day just sort of recapitulating the day and regathering my thoughts and 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 impressions because it, uh, I've been overwhelmed uh, by uh, sensory and and uh, intellectual and. and and, and emotional uh, impressions over the course of the day. And if I don't calm down, focus, and record what has just transpired, the next day will be even more confusing. So I think that's the difference. It's, it's, it's really f focus, intention, and desire to enter a world that otherwise has been closed to you. Now, if you were to look back at your writings in your travel journals, do you think that's as effective as looking back at travel photographs? Oh, yes, <laughs> much more effective right. because that reveals the traveler, um, the, the notebooks. Uh, the, they reveal the mind and, 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 and in many ways, the body, the, the, the experience uh, of the traveler himself uh, back then at the time. And, and in fact, the writing of the book was facilitated enormously by this, uh, that I could go back and pull those uh, journals out and, and, and reread them and, and, and relive in many ways the entire experience. Now, it's interesting, you, you said earlier that uh, you're a traveler, whereas a tourist uh, is always trying to escape something, mm. yet from this book, mm -hmm. from your memoir, we, we get the sense that you were always needing to escape. Well, I think in the first case, when I was 18 years old and I had dropped out of university and, and uh, it was the winter of 1958, 59, uh, I left my New England home, my small town um, and my family uh, and the kind of constrictions of, of that uh, environment uh, with the romantic idea um, of joining uh, Fidel Castro in the mountains of, uh, of Cuba. Um, uh, in order to overthrow that dictator Batista. And uh, unfortunately, I only got as far as, as Miami before they marched into Havana and didn't need me. But, but the idea was uh, I was going towards something, uh, but the fact was I was also trying to escape from my childhood, my family, my, my uh, home environment. Um, I think that was maybe the last time I truly was moving to escape uh, and not towards something. Now, you, you said there you, you wanted to run away to, to Cuba and mm -hmm. uh, join Castro's revolution. You actually ended up meeting and interviewing the man right. many, many years later. Did you ever tell him of your I plan? Do. Yes. Fact, and how did I he did. react? It was 47 years too late for the, uh, for the revolution. You'd missed the boat. Uh, yes, I did. I told him the story, so which speak. amused him very much. He, he thought it was quite a funny story of his 18-year-old kid who couldn't speak Spanish uh, washing up on the shores of of Miami and looking across the Gulf to uh, Cuba. Um, but he did, he, he listened to it and he said, well, you're actually very lucky you didn't make it. <laughs> and I think he's right. I probably would have ended up within a year or two imprisoned or shot against a wall. Let's uh, talk about your own country's uh, leader now. You've said mm -hmm. that Donald Trump is a dangerous, deluded maniac, a master manipulator. Now, it's been four or so months that he's been mm -hmm. in office. Have you? Uh, have you softened uh, towards him? No, if anything, I've only hardened my views toward him and and also my fears of what he can do and ha is doing and has done in that short time. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a most alarming time uh, for me in my lifetime uh, in America. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very frightened, um, frightened of catastrophe, of course, but also just that, that things are being done and undone in the United States that are going to uh, make it almost impossible, but certainly extremely difficult to, uh, to redeem, to, to, to get beyond and, and put back together again. I mean, just today, uh, pulling out of the, uh, of the Paris Accords uh, is, uh, is an example. I mean, how are we going to undo that? It's going to be very, very difficult. You're a writer. What does uh, kofefe mean, or kofefe? 
I don't is know. The tweet. Donald oh, the Trump's tweet. tweet. Oh, 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 that's his tweet. That's the. Oh, yes, of course. You have any idea what that means? <laughs> I haven't a clue. I think it was supposed to be coverage, but uh, but it came out kafefe. That's right. <laughs> I forgot that that. So it is come. pronounced kafefe. Well, that's how I pronounce it. I guess yes. <laughs> I think it's his attempt to to, uh, to speak a foreign language, but not not successful. Failing. Uh, well, we always ask our guests about a, a piece of art uh, that's got their mm. attention right now. Uh, mm. Russell, you've chosen "I Am Not Your Negro," the yes. Oscar-nominated right. documentary that uses the powerful prose of uh, civil rights firebrand mm. uh, James Baldwin. Why mm. did you choose this film? Well, probably a number of reasons. One is that it's a brilliant film. Uh, um, it's it's extraordinary and it's relevance today. That would be another reason um, uh, to the racial uh, um, situation in the United States uh, and to the racial history of the United States. Uh, and there would be a third reason is that James Baldwin as a writer who had an enormous impact on me and still does, a prophetic writer um, whom I began reading back in the uh, late 1950s, early 1960s when I was a boy. Um, and then maybe a fourth reason is that the director, uh, creator of the film, Raoul Peck, a uh, Haitian French uh, uh, filmmaker, is also a dear friend of mine. And, oh, and I right. had some uh, connection to the making of the film, uh, at least in, as much as, as Raoul occasionally consulted me. And we were, uh, I was aware of the process of the making of the film over, over the several years that it wow. took for him to make That's it. Yeah. But it's a brilliant and wonderful film and, and an important one as well. Indeed. Okay, well, uh, we'll leave you with a clip of the film I Am Not Your Negro. Russell Banks, thank you once again uh, for joining us thank today. You. For more arts and culture news, head to our website and connect with us on social media. Stay with us. Lots more coming up after this. When the Israelis pick up guns or the Poles or the Irish or any white man in the world says, give me liberty or give me death, the entire white world applauds. When a black man says exactly the same thing, word for word, he is judged a criminal and treated like one, and everything possible is done to make an example of this bad nigger so there won't be any more like him.